Hi, welcome and or welcome back to the channel. My name is Sarah and today we're going to talk about some of the fun things that I learned from the rise and reign of the mammals. This is a chunky nonfiction that follows the evolution and development of the mammalian, let's call it family bush, <laughs> that started uh, when mammals, you know, were just wee little creatures darting about below the feet of dinosaurs till they have become the dominant class on Earth. Now, I have selected a few of my favorite little fun facts. Some of these, one or two of these are more complicated than others, but don't require too much explanation. And some of these are simply the existence of some funny and or horrifying creatures. So, let's get into it. First off, I learned that... And let me read this name out to you. Arthropluria existed. Arthropluria is, quote, a monstrous millipede more than six and a half feet, two meters long. So there you go. Six and a half foot millipede for your nightmares. In addition to that, there was a pigeon-sized dragonfly flittering around at the same time. This was during the Philadelphian era. So early, early, early on, um... 325 million years ago, so don't worry. <laughs> no time recently, but still. Six and a half feet. Really puts our little centipedes to shame. Next up is a very interesting fact, especially if you have small children or, like me, had a lot of dinosaur toys as a kid. Dimetrodon, this little fella that you see often on dino posters, in packs of dino toys, not technically a dinosaur in the reptilian sense. Dimetrodon is, it, though it looks reptilian like a dinosaur, it's what we call a stem mammal. We, as if I'm intelligent enough for this. What they call a stem mammal in that it is one of the earliest divisions off of the reptilian tree into the mammalian, uh, the, the jaw had developed. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to say. The jaw had developed in the way that leads down to the mammalian branch of evolution, which is absolutely fascinating. So, not a dinosaur at all. Should not be in that tiny baggie. And yet, it's always there. In fact, two days ago, my daughter had a bath bomb. And when she tossed it in the little bath, her surprise toy was a dimetrodon. Was it a, quote, stem mammals bath bomb? No. It was a dinosaur one. So, that is incorrect. Fact number three is the Lilliput effect. Now, this is one of the more complicated ones. I'm going to make it as easy to understand for myself as possible and for you. Uh, basically, this is the decrease in a body size in animals that survive mass extinctions or climate catastrophes. So post-asteroid, going from the book here, most things that were larger were wiped out or quickly uh, evolved down to a smaller body shape and size because it's easier to maintain a stable temperature. You have less that you need to fuel your body a, a, a smaller caloric intake. I thought that was absolutely fascinating. And I really love the name, the Lilliput effect, because it is a reference to Gulliver's Travels. And it's just a really fun word. So that was, that was very fascinating. He went on at a certain later section in the book. Some researchers believe that due to the climate catastrophe, the climate change going on right now, some researchers believe that humans may eventually evolve to be smaller will become shorter and less dense to help us in the changing climate because it is going to get more extreme in different ways. So I thought that was fun. Fact four is another slightly complicated one and that is during the evolution of the jaw some of the bones along the back of the jaw actually broke off and became tiny and became the what are they called the hammer anvil and those three bones in your ear I can't remember all three of them those those jaw bones that we that mammals had at one time broke off and became those small bones that we use in our ears. That is what allows us to hear while we chew. Some people actually in embryo never actually lose that connection between the jaw bones and the ears, so they can't hear very well while they chew. It just doesn't work out. That is cool. That is cool. But the coolest thing about that is you can watch that happen fast time in an embryo. So to quote the book again. Put another way, the developing embryo is like a film that captures in high speed the evolutionary journey of the jaw bones changing to ear bones. So I just thought that was very interesting that something that took millions of years to develop and change, we can watch in fast time in an embryo. Um, 
it's absolutely wild to me. Fact number five is a very fun fact, especially for, <laughs> uh, if you know any Australian history, you may already know this. I know a little bit. I have been recently reading up more on the, the topic, but this one really cracked me up. A gentleman named John Hunter was one of the first men to arrive in the settling forces of Britain in Australia, and he was sending back skeletons, taxidermy bodies of creatures to a rather famous museum curator turned scientist, George Shaw. Mr. Shaw was kind of infamous in this period for his antics. He refused to believe that the platypus was a real mammal and in fact thought it was something that was quote Frankenstein together by pranksters. <laughs> then when he did receive de definite proof that it was real, more and more people reported seeing it, he refused to believe that it laid eggs. <laughs> in fact, they didn't believe on the whole, scientists in this era didn't believe that it laid eggs, laid eggs until there was this like mass terrible extermination of platypuses. They hired about 150 Aboriginal people to slaughter as many as they could find until they could find one that was like in the process of developing embryos or laying eggs. And at that point they found one and they were forced to believe this thing. Not to mention when they did this, they treated the Aboriginal people horribly. They, they just weren't nice people. But it cracks me up a little bit to think of these stuffy, stuffy nose turned up men getting the skeleton and thinking, well, that's not real. And then lo and behold, platypuses are just platypusing around in Australia. They don't care that you don't believe in them. They're doing what they do best. <laughs> fact number six is a very, very interesting fact. And it's something I never actually thought of is how dinosaurs breathe. Dinosaurs breathed with a flow through lung, much like a bird. And I'll read this description out to you so you understand what that is. This feat of engineering is choreographed by balloon-like sacs which connect to the lung and funnel air through in a precise sequence. When, and he's referencing a bird at this point, a bird breathes in, some of the oxygen-rich air goes directly across the lungs while some is shunted into the air sacs. Then when the air sacs contract, the still oxygenated, oxygenated, did I say that right? Air inside is pressed along the lung during exhalation, meaning birds and the giant dinosaurs with the same lungs take in oxygen while breathing in and out. This means dinosaurs got more oxygen with each breath than a simil similarly sized mammal. The air sacs extend through the body and even into the bones, acting as an air conditioning system, lightening the skeleton. The end result is Large dinosaurs were more efficient breathers, could cool their bodies easier, and had lighter and more limber skeletons. Which is what most people believe the reason that they got so big is because they could control their internal systems so much better, they were able to take in more on a regular basis and they just, they just got bigger. This one's a quick one. Whales don't smell. Not in a traditional sense. They don't have that. It's fascinating. <laughs> I think this is fact number eight now. But... If you ever see a drawing of dinosaurs and they're standing on grassy ground, it is incorrect. Grasses, though they may have been around at the time of the dinos, were not prevalent in any way at all. We're going to quote the book again. There was little open ground for grasses to fan across and whatever available would have been cloaked in ferns and shrubs. Thus there were no grasslands when the archaic placentals were building the first mammal dominated ecosystems of the Paleocene in New Mexico after the era of the dinosaurs. Or when the trinity of primates, oddly toed parasodactyls and even and even toed artiodactyls advanced across the northern continents in step with the uh, PETM global warming. So even after the era of the dinosaurs when mammals were becoming more and more common and complex and evolving out and taking dominance, there were no wide grasslands. Dinosaurs may have munched on grass, but it was in very small quantities. What you should see on the ground in those artistic renderings is like ferns and shrubs. Absolutely fascinating. In a related note, uh, grass dominance, the, the spread of grasses is actually what led to the development of horses teeth and other like grass eating creatures, what led to the development of their teeth being the way they are, which is super cool to me. Fact number nine, and this is an American history fact as well. Thomas Jefferson <laughs> was obsessed with um, ancient giant mammals, specifically a giant creature he thought was a giant lion, which was in fact a giant sloth, and 
mammoths. He was obsessed with these, thought that they had to be real somewhere, and it offended him, the idea of extinction. He thought that this couldn't happen. It would upset the natural balance. Things don't go extinct. Part of the reason for the Louisiana Purchase or something, he used it to take advantage of this. He wanted Lewis and Clark to find evidence of the megafauna, like the the giant lynxes and the giant or the giant sloths and the giant lions that he believed existed. He was certain that they existed somewhere out there. It wasn't until 1823 when he wrote a letter to John Adams that he had to admit that quote certain races of animals have become extinct. That was interesting. Thomas Jefferson is uh he was a he was a he was something. <laughs> Oh, this is a funny fact. Fact number 10 for you fine folks is the Russian Gorex. To quote a researcher who studies this as she was speaking to Mr. Steve when he was looking at the skeleton of one, it is, as she described, a wildebeest that made fart noises with its face to communicate, of course. So just imagine for me, if you will, a wide expanse of land, green, shrubberies, ferns, some grasses, and a bunch of bulbous-headed wildebeests making farting sounds. That's good. That's good. Our final fun fact is a saber-toothed tiger fact. And it's kind of two-parted. So the first part is that... Some, I'm, and I know I'm going to say this wrong because I'm terrible at words. Simladon saber-toothed tigers were in fact no tigers. They were distantly related. I will quote here. DNA extracted from La Brea bones, some saber-toothed tiger bones, and other fossils across Simladon's North and South American range confirm that the saber-tooth is a cat but part of an archaic family that branched off the family tree more than 15 million years ago. Only distantly related to today's tigers. Very cool. And another fun saber tooth fact that really just stuck in my brain. You get these ideas and you see all the time saber tooth tigers in like media and stuff just biting and tearing. No, Smelodon was a precision killer. It would have storm stormed out from its lair, subdued its prey with its muscular arms, opened its mouth wide and delivered a perfectly aimed puncture to the throat with its sabers, then stood back to watch its victim bleed to death. The saber canines were used much less like knives and much more like ice picks, to use his example, because the teeth were large but incredibly thin. Uh, Simolodon, Simolodon actually means scalpel tooth, not saber tooth. Uh, so yeah, they, they didn't rip and tear. They bit and just waited for the creature to bleed out and die or to die from shock. And I just thought that was super cool. <laughs> so that is it on fun facts I learned from the rise and reign of the mammals. I am certain that I have mispronounced some words and phrases in here uh, and these facts may change. This book came out last year, 2022, I believe in, well I don't know when because it doesn't actually give me a month, but this did come out in 2022 and this field of science is always evolving and changing in what they've learned and seen. So in a few years this information could be out of date. But for now, these are things that researchers have found from bones, DNA, that sort of thing, and believe. And I just thought this was absolutely fascinating. This author also has another book called The Rise and Fall of the Dinosaurs. I'm so sorry. It's up there. <laughs> I haven't read that one yet, but I fully intend to. And when I do, I will hopefully be able to do another video like this. So like comment subscribe if you enjoyed this this is hopefully something more something i'll be doing more often on this channel uh, let me know your fun facts down below specifically about mammals their ancestry and that sort of era and i will talk to you guys again soon thanks for watching bye hello it is i fresh from the sewer teenage mutant ninja turtle sarah <laughs> and i am here with 11 fun facts that I learned from The Rise and Reign of the Mammals by Steve Brissett. <laughs>